All right, good evening. This is a special meeting of the budget workshop of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, August 24th, 2020 at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is also being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel, and the recording will be posted on the District 58's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. This evening, members of the audience will have an opportunity for extended public comment with the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over to my right. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by calling 630-743-4085 and recording their comment. Comments will be accepted until we reach the public comment portion of the agenda. We will play all comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment, up to three minutes each. Should there be time remaining, we will take additional in-person comments. All right, let's get, uh, get this started with the flag salute and pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, seeing as Mr. Drayfall has already hit the podium, go ahead and get us started with the tentative budget workshop. Thank you, and uh, to thank the board for, uh, this is a little later than we normally uh, present the budget. Uh, it's usually several weeks, or, or sometimes, I believe last year, uh, we presented the initial tentative budget in July with the final approved at the August board meeting. Um, school districts in the state of Illinois have through the first quarter of their fiscal year, which ends at the end of September, to approve their budget, um, given the fact that uh, the state has that in, in, in school codes. The only local government that can start the year without a fiscal budget in place. Uh, and that's because uh, oftentimes the revenue uh, is not uh, completely known that comes from the state at that point. Uh, we know and have a good idea what that will be. But there have been a lot of other variables and unknowns in this year that makes it a very unique year. With any presentation of budget, we always want to start out and talk about mission and vision uh, and, and the goals of the district. And that's where we you know, base and you know, have our foundation of how we operate and what we do. And that is what, the, what feeds the budget. Um, much of the decisions for a budget uh, are made long before we get to this point or even we get into the summer. Uh, this budget, again, is a unique piece, uh, be, uh, given the times. Uh, but staffing decisions are made uh, January, February, March, April. Uh, obviously, we've made adjustments and held off on some things and moved on others as, as, things, as, as we've been able to adjust as much as we can adjust um, what we knew then to what we know now. But this is always where we start is where our mission and vision is. Justin, it's not working. Sorry. Uh, goal 3.2. Uh, this is a piece that we talk about in the strategic plan about ensuring the availability of resources necessary to reinvigorate and, sust <laughs> and sustain district facilities, support quality programming, and attract uh, and retain high effective staff to meet the needs of all students. <clears throat> um, one of the pieces we always look at is making sure that we are ensuring um, that we're covering and, and doing what we need to do and having those resources available uh, to do that. Uh, this year has been, as, it, as we keep saying, a challenging year. Um, we continually work for, work through uh, all of the twists and turns and, and curves that we've been working through since March, uh, going one direction and another direction. Um, but the goal is always to continue to provide consistent service to students and staff um, as we would with any other year. 
Um, <clears throat> this year, we have, you know, we, we have talked about for the last 12 months, 18 months for the FAC and through the board, um, the Financial Advisory Committee and the board, um, how to manage our resources and fund balance. Um, we said that we would want to always make sure that we would not present a deficit budget. Uh, we would not intentionally present a deficit budget. There are things here that we um, have been hit upon that require us to, to, to present a deficit budget, uh, you know, and, and it's hard to, to shift at the point that we are um, where we're at now. Um, it will be problematic, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, what we will want to make sure we do as we go forward, and we do as a best practice work on five-year planning and five-year projections and get, us, get the district back into the position where we are not in a deficit, we're adding the fund balance where we add resources, where we're able to maintain and sustain the programs uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, we certainly cannot maintain uh, this year's structure for very long. <clears throat> so some of the, extent, the assumptions that we've gone through uh, in this budget, there are adjustments. Uh, there are adjustments that started uh, in February and March when we started talking as a normal format of making adjustments in special ed funding, uh, putting some staffing and bringing some students back in that were out private placed or at SASID, and so bringing it into a less restrictive uh, structure and where it is a benefit financially as well. I mean, there's, there's a cost piece that makes more sense along with that, um, that less restrictive uh, environment. Uh, we've also worked to figure out some areas that we, in this, in this structure, what will happen, what won't happen, what might happen. You know, we, it's hard to predict today where we're going to go in the next school year. When do we go back into, into a modified on-site? What does that look like? Will we do field trips? Um, will we have, you know, what's our sub-cost gonna be? Uh, are we looking at a half year? So there are some expenditures in here that may or may not take place. So we have put fund, our normal funding or, ha you know, a portion of our normal funding in for field trips for the spring and for stipends for athletics for the spring in the event we're able to, to do that. Um, if not, if those, you know, if we don't use those resources, then, you know, they won't be spent and those will be available and, and will come in in a better position. Uh, those, you know, those will help bring in uh, a lower expenditure piece. We, um, looking at transportation, the district, the board approved contract extensions with its two large transportation firms for 6% uh, uh, increases, 4% increases. Given the fact that we are working through what this first trimester, quarter, you know, period of the fall will be with them, we won't be paying 100% of what we anticipated. Right now, what we have budgeted is about 98% of last year's budget. Um, that brings in and resumes that we're still paying those, those increased rates when we are at full, but that full may not be until January. And at that point, we also may not have all of those routes that we ended with March 12th. They may be smaller or fewer routes because there'll be fewer students wanting to take transportation. So there's some of those assumptions we make into this along with those pieces that we automatically put in there anticipating and hoping for that there's a need. You know, again, like, you know, I talk about the field trips, uh, outdoor education, now outdoor education is a, is a zero sum game. So the expense and the revenue are, you know, are off the setting uh, because that, that piece pays for it. Um, medical insurance, one of the bright pieces that we've talked about is that we anticipate the wellness, health and wellness committee and I'm looking at Greg and I sent out an email and I forgot to include you in it for the health of <laughs> <laughs> So you're going to get an email in a little while. Um, <clears throat> coming up in the next week. Uh, that 
given the the, the for, you know the parameters where where everything's at, no one's using. There's a lot less usage of health providers. That is bringing in a, a, a benefit into that plan and that fund is doing very well. That means our rates will probably not have to increase in January. Now, because we had two rate increases by math, you know, we had two rate increases in the last fiscal year. We had one right at the beginning of the fiscal year and then one halfway through. That means last year's budget still has to go up a little bit to be a, to keep it zero. So we're about two and a half percent. You know, we'll, the committee will work on that in the next meeting, and we'll start seeing some of those you know detailed claims and assumptions and projections from our our uh, consultant uh, group alternatives, and then we can make and that'll come for the recommendation. But there's still even with a the flat, there's a there's a slight increase in expense. Uh, there are reductions in food service, given the fact the first half we won't have that. There's also a reduction in some of the you know, revenue as well. Um, we anticipate we won't have um, you know, some of the overtime, um, substitute pay, and we will have, we have currently some openings. We always cyclically have openings in um, educational aids and, 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 and instructional aids at this time of year. Um, you know, we have, there's a turnover factor to that, uh, to those positions. We will be mindful in how those positions come back in because if we don't have a need for someone right now, uh, as we're on remote, then we don't need to fill it. And that is a savings against our, our expense. You know, and we've, we presume some of that piece and we've put some of that to bring some of the expenses down. We hope to look at that and maybe there's some more, but you know, we've made some of those adjustments. We've had to increase operation and maintenance for contractual services. One of the things we've talked about through the safety and well-being uh, and, and all of the structure that we were putting in place over the summer so that custodians can focus on what's in the building for cleaning is looking at what we can do that is part of the responsibilities outside of that building. You know, some of the landscape piece that they currently, that they maintain along with our contractors, as well as snow removal. Custodi head custodians have to go clear uh, areas at, you know, before when we have snow. So we have increased contractual expenditures where, so that we can increase our contracted service for snow removal so the custodians can focus on sanitation and cleanliness of the buildings uh, during this period of time. So depending on when we come back from remote and depending on how that works, you know, there's some of those pieces that, that can have some impact, but we've budgeted for them if, if we need to do that. Um, capital revenue is always a wash piece through. We've included, you know, the money, uh, we still continually work with the state um, because there is bond money put aside to cover the El Sierra playground and we continually work with them uh, and in hopes that we will be able to get that done uh, this next year. And so that is in the budget as well. The big uh, pieces that caught, along with some of those increased expenses, the area that is a focus that has, is causing our deficit structure. Um, we purposefully budgeted and staffed OKEEP at folks who committed, to parents who committed to O'Keep early on. But given the structure and the format as, as the summer developed and where we're at today, the district decided that was not a, a doable piece. So we have a, you know, a staffing structure, O'Keep, you know, just to remind everyone, um, that half of that extra half, that extra extended program is completely funded, staffing and all, completely funded by the fees. So when those fees aren't in, that's a million dollars. So that puts a big structure piece. So looking at your budget, if you know the question people always ask, how much is it, you know, to the district if we didn't charge for the key fees? It's a million dollars deficit into the current program structure if we didn't charge OK fees. 
Um, so that's a big, that's half of your, uh, the deficit right there. Um, there's also reductions obviously in, in, in tuition payments for pre-K. Uh, there are some fee adjustments and fees that are down, uh, registration fees and so forth. Um, transportation reimbursement is the big piece. We saved a million dollars last year um, when we didn't have 50 days of transportation. That comes back to us. We, I mean, so we net out 250,000 to the good. The problem is that we do lose uh, on the reimbursement side from the state um, the next year uh, because of that. So that's $750,000. Interesting, Ken, we've talked about it for several months. Um, you know, we know that you know, that's going to be uh, lower uh, given the economy and, and that's going to be for a period of time. We were at the point where we're about $300,000 in income a year off of interest income. Uh, that's going to be a while before that comes back. Corporate personal property replacement tax is a tax that comes from the state. Um, this, I will tell you, I am happy we only lost $130,000. We anticipated, most people anticipated it being much, much worse. I don't know, there's, I mean, obviously there's enough because it's based on corporate sales and corporate taxes that come from the, from the state. Um, fortunately, obviously there's some pieces that are still running and operating uh, that are doing better than, you know, it's still an impact, but it's, it's not as bad as we first initially thought. Um, all of that together, I, I will also say, we have conditionally been where we have an increase in corporate or in, in, in state aid. One, two percent. It's, it's not a lot, but it's a couple, maybe $150,000, $200,000 a year. Again, fortunately, the state level set state aid. So we didn't lose, but we did, you know, because that was a conversation early on that there may be a loss. So the state has backstopped and held everyone harmless, but we didn't increase um, to meet and keep up with our expense increases and in structures. <clears throat> so I, I did print out um, the recap table on your, your place because I obviously know that this is not something that's real um, readable. But when we come out and put all of that together and do the recap, the operational deficit is about is just a little over $2 million right now. Now, we have traditionally worked so that when we bring you the final budget next month, we hope to find and sharpen up our pencils a bit, and that will be better. It will not be magnitudes better. You know, if it's a couple hundred thousand dollars that we go through and sharpen up and that we have some assumptions and adjust, you know, the, you know and, and there may be some revenue structure that may usually at this point we're guessing and being conservative in our state numbers when we first do our initial budget and they come in a little higher. That won't happen this, this time because we know what those are going to be. We may get a few pieces but it's not going to be a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars differential on the revenue in most likelihood. You know, in Hopefully, we will go through and find some areas that I may have, you know, we may have overestimated on some expenses that we can find that we aren't going to be able to do or not have to do, and we can sharpen up a little bit there. But it is going to be uh, somewhere around the magnitude of of where we're at today, and, and that, you know, 1.7, 1 1.6, 1 .6, 1, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood, it's going to be that area. So the question is then when we get into that piece, as we talk about every March, April, is do we have funds on hand uh, to make it through the year? We've talked about there is before those early tax payments come in and we come towards that payroll date in June. Um, we sometimes have a million dollars in the bank. Well, when you look at, and, and it would be one thing if that revenue, if we were talking about the revenue shortfall, was gonna be with the revenue that came in at the end. 
you know, in that property tax piece that comes in the second half uh, in those last 30 to 40 days of our fiscal year. That's not the case here. You know, that money, we know what that is, and, and, and presumably that's going to be come in as, as normal. This money is, is particularly when it's the oak keep fees, that is cash that comes in continually because people pay on a month. Those people pay either full up in the beginning or they pay on a monthly basis. There will be some, some fees that come in in the spring and so forth, but by and large, this money is money that is, is lost to us in revenue throughout the entire year. So that does put a challenge on us on the cash position. Um, you can obviously take one million and two millions in the hole, and that puts us, you know, where we are minus a million dollars. Depending on timing, and it does come down to we get up early taxes sometimes a week before, because we, we have to pay payroll on Wednesday for the Friday. We have to have the cash on hand on Wednesday. We need to have that money on hand before that Friday before. Um, depending on how that structure looks it is very likely it is very likely that we are not going to have funds on hand to cover that payroll and we will be looking at that and that is something we'll have to when we get into february and in march uh if we must take um action on and, and take to the board recommendation to do something to 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 cover that now there are some options Tax anticipation warrants are a normal process that that happens. The district issues a short-term bond called tax anticipation warrant or TAWS. And as soon as that property, that, that money comes in, then we pay it off. So it's a short 30 day, 20 day loan of bonds that the board passes a resolution. We go out in the market, we get them, pay the interest rate back, it's a little bit of money. There are other options that are available. We can talk to the bank and develop a line of credit or a loan structure, those are also things that have been done by people in the past. Certainly we will talk to, I'll go through and, and have some conversations uh, mainly with some underwriters to find out what doesn't, what impacts us the least long term on any rating that might be if we decide to do something down the road. Um, if, uh, there's also a possibility that we could, if we so choose, if we had funds in the MRF, the Medical Reserve Fund, which is an asset of the districts, to put it into the cash account, the, the checking account for that five day window and then immediately pay it back. And that is an option as well. It's just a short term moving money from one account to another once all the money comes in, money goes back in. It's borrowing from our, from our own internal bank ourselves. There's another option that goes to an issue we've started to talk about, I think back in March, and we've kind of pushed it off and then, but it's something that needs to be in our projection and our planning going forward as we work through the next FY22 budget and our five-year plans going forward. And that is, we understand that the, the master facility plan in its large piece was on, is on hold at this point. However, we, our needs don't diminish and we have some pieces that, can be, that need to be dealt with. And so internally and operationally, we've talked about some areas of we know we're several years before we get to that MRF and some of those larger projects. If there are projects that are, in, particularly in the energy, the boilers and so forth, that have a short-term payback, that is, we replace some lighting systems, we replace some boilers, we have some grant money that, that is available out there to do that, and we know the, the savings of light bulb replacements and electricity savings and so forth over the next 10 or 12 years is going to be X. We're going to say, okay, that X is $75,000 a year. And if we do 
X million dollars in bonds and we set up a $125,000 year payment out of operations, then we know 75 is coming from our savings. And the other 50 we're going to have to find and we're just going to pull from operations and pay for it. And it's going to be part of our operational expense for the next 12 years. And this is a time that we look at because rates are very, very low to borrow. And so what does it get done? We have a roof that is an issue. And we, and we also have some issues. How much is our service, our, our performance services that we have right now that we know we're spending $40,000 a year on a boiler for someone to come in because it's not something our maintenance people can do. And we know the efficiencies and so forth and we have some savings. Um, we have some opportunities to take some of those annual savings put them into using against a bond issuance cost, as well as perhaps the roof that needs to be dealt with and some other building envelope things that we know we are going to have to do in short term and put those into a bond where, some, where we're, we're using the low interest rate market. We would, you know, and if that is something we can look forward to and do, and it would be something we would do in the summer, that, that would put the opportunity of borrowing those funds earlier and having those funds in working cash for that short period of time because we're not going to start any of those projects until after school is done in, in June or May or whatever that case would be and then we're doing those work. So that is also an acceptable option and a, an option that we can consider. Obviously there's a, you know, there's a piece to that capital need that goes to that, but I, I wanted to make you all aware of the benefit of doing that um, in this piece as we're thinking long term about some of the other jigsaw puzzle pieces of, of this process. It's a lot of time spent on borrowing. <clears throat> so, moving to the calendar. Um, Approving the tentative budget uh, and putting it on display for 30 days and it is for August. September we get into approving of, of the final 21 budget. October you have the initial review of the tax levy and then a November approval. Uh, December looking at um, flushing out the five year, a five year model uh, of, of budget projections and, and, and 22. And then coming back in, in February with a projection and, and approval. Um, and I put approval reductions as needed, approved you know, fees and so forth. One of the pieces that is unfortunate about this budget that will impact us going into 22 is every year we look at the, the landscape that we are at to, in February as to what that will be come August. And we staff and structure accordingly. If we are in the current structure and in the current landscape that we are in, or we don't, it, 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 it will be very difficult for us to financially be able, let me say this, if we're not into a different structure, financially it's going to be very difficult for the district to sustain staffing at a different format or landscape than it's in in January and February. O'Keep is a perfect, is the example that, I, that we could use. If we don't see O'Keep coming back, we cannot plan for it to be in February. We cannot automatic, we cannot financially automatically assume that it will be there in August because that staffing differential is so great that we'll never make it up. If that makes, does that make, does that track? You know, it's just, we've just, we don't have that capacity to handle, nor do we have, uh, and some districts are looking, they're looking at this, you know, they're not, they are looking at the same revenue reductions, they're not necessarily with the O keep in that piece as we are, but looking at the same issues and the same concerns and some of the other expenditures that they're laying out and some of them are looking at tax anticip or I'm sorry, working cash bonds that they will levy that they will go through an issue because they have debt capacity to do that, and they will cover their their operational expense over the short term, 
and they won't be able to impact, they won't have to impact their programs because they, can, they have that capacity. We just don't have that capacity. We don't have that ability to borrow um, and then use that debt extension service base to cover that expense, that, that borrowing, without it hitting operations. Um, so then we come to you know, updating in, in, in February, um, put in there, you know, obviously March making those decisions on borrowing and, you know, is appropriate, and then reviewing updates as we go through in, in uh, fiscal year 22 in April and May. So some of the pieces that we keep looking at that we have to be mindful as we move forward. And some of the things that people were, there was a res, you know, the conversations that happened in the school business area um, in April was what happens if state revenue goes down? Well, state revenue didn't go down this year. Uh, they, they, kept a, they kept at a hold harmless level flat. I'm not sure what condition the state's in. I don't think it's improved much. Um, I don't know how long they can, can, they can sustain that under this economic system. Um, right now, consumer price index is what we grow on uh, for our CPI for our property tax, which is our most pe our biggest piece. Uh, that had been negative in the spring. It is now about one percent. So, depending on gas prices, are not down to a dollar anymore or two dollars anymore. Um, yeah, those and that has a big piece to that. So, if that grows, that helps over time and we will know you know in December or January we know what that number will be for the following year we have a you know the fiscal year is split between those two levies so the levy that the board will adopt in November for the next year has a 2.3 percent CPI that is helping with this budget because that's the second half of revenue for fiscal year 21 it's the first half of revenue for 22 we don't know what the second half of the revenue for 22 will be we do know that the tax increment, the TIF district for downtown is coming off. That will have an impact for 20, fiscal year 22 and 23. That will help the district sustain and help out substantially. It will, but if we use that piece to sustain programs, we don't have it for other things to help make up some of those differentials in those capital items and some of those areas that you know, had been conversations to talk about in areas that, you know, we've had that, you know, we'll, as we go through, how does that help us? What do we do? How does that get the district out of its capital needs um, piece as a, as a one of those functional jigsaw puzzle pieces? Um, and of course, you know, the other things are what if? What if we have a substantial capital issue? Obviously, we're going to go out into the market um, and you know, and, and have to do something in the short term to, to take care of some of those issues. We have old buildings; uh, they have issues, and they need to be dealt with. And you know, those are di those are community assets that need to be maintained. This is where I give it over to Dr. <laughs> Russell. Okay, um, Todd, thank you very much. Um, the reality is that we've done a good job over the last year, two, three years, to put us back on a path where we're not only neutral in our spending, but we're saving money. So it's not all doom and gloom here in District 58. If we didn't do those things over the last several years, in my view, we'd be in much worse shape than we're in. This is also not unique to District 58. Every school district in Illinois, for the most part, is going to be running some kind of an uh, operating deficit because of the crisis that we're in. What makes our district so unique is the fact that we have such low taxes and we live very um, close to that line here in District 58. We, we don't have, you know, 100% uh, you know, on hand and 125 and like that, like some districts do. So the bottom line is when we go through a crisis, we're not going to be able to weather that crisis for several years. You might be able to weather it for a year, and I think we will this school year. However, what happens if we don't recover quickly? And so there's a reason why I asked Todd to do this slide. I feel as the superintendent, 
I need to continue to come back to the Board of Education and have that tough conversation uh, with the Board of Education and our community so everybody is aware of where we could possibly be headed. Uh, today, the theme for our opening day speech was, um, you know, tough times don't last, tough people do. And, and I really think that our school district is tough, and we will get through this, we really do. But the way we'll get through this is by making key <clears throat> decisions in a strategic fashion so we don't impact the services that our children deserve, but yet we still put us on a path to fiscal sustainability. So again, back to the reality. This crisis has forced immediate needs and they need to be met. Um, others may have to be put off for a while. District 58 cannot sustain a multi-year deficit. I think that's pretty obvious from what Todd just shared. Our tax base does not allow for large fund balances. It's one of the greatest things about Downers Grove, but it also can become an Achilles heel in times like this. We have very low taxes compared to our neighboring districts. Now, please, I understand we live in the state of Illinois, so there really isn't such thing as very low taxes, but compared to some of our neighbors, we do have a lower tax rate. Um, the other reality here is we don't have extra programming that can be easily cut. So when we talk about an O'Keefe program or a full day kindergarten program, that's pretty much the norm in what you would see in most uh, suburban school districts here in Downers Grove. We don't have a full day kindergarten and, and we've made that decision as a school district, but it's not like I can come as the superintendent and say, okay, well, if you just cut X, Y, and Z, you'll be in the clear. A lot of those decisions have been made a long time ago and those are community-based decisions, but because of that, there's not a lot of operating expenses that we can just simply slice away. So, what kind of conversations do we need to start having as a school board? And this is not a new conversation. That's where I credit this board. We've been having these conversations. We had them all last year. We had a conversation of, should we look at a facility plan that might put a referendum ahead of some restructuring conversations? Um, the community recommended that we made that decision to put the facility conversation ahead of some of those restructuring conversations. Well, in the middle of a crisis and you're not able to go forward at this time, with the facility conversation, you may have to flip those two because they both need to be answered. So what I hope to do today is not to scare the public, not to scare the Board of Education, but to lay the foundation for some conversations that we're gonna have to start having around Thanksgiving and then revisit them around the holidays and then revisit them in uh, the winter time because we're gonna have to make some decisions so we don't end up being in a fiscal crisis year after year after year. So some considerations we're gonna to have to talk about. Referendum considerations, education fund, and then of course construction bond. Uh, the education fund would be to sustain programs or to add programs that the board would choose, and then construction bonds are obviously to finance some of our facility improvements. So there's some conversations we can have. One of the realities that I think we have to face in that conversation is in tough economic times, those are not two things that easily pass uh, a community. And so that's just something to put in the back of your head. Uh, we need to take a look at our building utilization in boundaries in District 58. And I know that's a very, very hard conversation to have. Um, neighborhood schools are a very, very popular thing and for good reason, right? That's what people love about our community. However, you end up with a lot of inequities in your schools and you end up with some buildings that are super overcrowded and other ones that are underutilized. Look no further than our two middle schools. I think that is the, probably the glaring example that you see in our community. Back you know, 21 years ago when I started at O'Neill, the two middle schools were pretty much balanced, about 600 kids apiece. They're no longer like that. You've got O'Neill that is significantly underutilized and Herrick that is busting at the seams. Um, Lester School is now bigger or runs very close to O'Neill Middle School. That should show you just how much the population has shifted in our school systems. I recognize though that is a very, very hard conversation, but again, going back to the tough times, we're in one of the toughest times you're ever gonna see as a school board. And so those are conversations we may have to uh, really dive into. Consolidation of administrative centers and or programs. Let me explain what I mean by that. You have 15 facilities in District 58 right now. Those 15 facilities, when we look at building utilization and boundaries, we need to have a serious conversation. We've been having this conversation with facilities. Does it make sense to carry 15 buildings? So I'll give you a, a perfect example, Longfellow in the ASC. Does it make sense to carry Longfellow, a building that is well beyond its years, and to continue to invest in a building like that or the ASC center 
when you might have better operational services and cut costs if you consolidate those, those two centers into one. You also have programs like your preschool program that is split between two different sites. Could you take one site and combine that with an administrative center, combine that with some of your programs like a preschool, free up that building, redistribute, and then you know, help with that utilization? Please know I'm not saying this is something we ought to do today, but it certainly will help with the bottom line in the long term because one of the goals I have as a superintendent and I know our community and board has as well, is how do we be great uh, stewards of the taxpayer money and don't impact our students' services, right? And so sometimes you have to make those tough decisions. So selling of assets, um, one of the biggest assets that we have is the Longfellow Center. I don't take that lightly saying that because I know it's such a fixture in that community in the Pierce Downer neighborhood. But that is an asset um, that if we consolidate it to administrative centers, that could help sustain us for a very long time. Restructuring of staff due to the changing landscape. And what I mean by this is we could have a situation where we return to phase five this year. Well, if we return to phase five, we may have to add staff. Todd also just alluded to the way staffing works, because I know people out there are probably going, why are we continuing to carry full-time kindergarten staffing if we're not offering full-time kindergarten, right? Well, one of the things is, as Todd stated, in order to do a reduction of force for staff, you have to do that 45 days tied to the preceding school year. So no district could have predicted that we would be in this situation. But if we get in this situation next year and we, we align to that, we're gonna have to take a look at all of our staffing across the board and say, what can we do and then what should we put off until we know that the economics of it are gonna you know, be in our favor of that. So that's something that we really have to take a look at. I don't want any staff to misinterpret what I just said because when you say that as a superintendent, people automatically go, okay, we're going to have to kindergarten program or they're getting rid of this. We're not getting rid of anything right now, but we do have to have those conversations if we get to February because we can't keep a million dollars of staffing that we can't afford on the other end. So that's something that we really have to have a conversation about. So again, the point here isn't to scare the board or scare the community. The point here though is, and, and we've been having this conversation, we may have to flip that conversation and put facilities over here for a while and put some of these structuring conversations here uh, because we just don't have the luxury to weather a crisis like this for multiple years. And I do fear some of the things that Todd had stated earlier may come to fruition where we might get past a piece of this crisis, but economically it might take a year or two to get past that. And so restructuring conversations, um, in my view, really have to be on our radar and we'll continue to bring those back to the Board of Education. I fully recognize the, the nervousness that that can cause in a community and that's not my intention. My intention is to make sure that we keep our district on a sustained path moving forward. We don't cut the services for our children and that we really make sure that we're great stewards of the taxpayers' money as the board has always done. So with that, that concludes our tentative budget presentation. Uh, Todd, myself, the uh, ASC team are available for uh, questions. I do want to just again highlight for the public that this is a tentative budget. And so we will spend the next 30 days taking board feedback sharpening the pencil, as Todd said, and then coming back at the end of September and then asking the board to vote for a final uh, budget. So all the board is doing tonight is putting out a draft that will be picked apart and, uh, you know, hopefully drilled down. Okay. Any questions from the board? All right, I'll just jump right in. Um, Todd, thank you very much um, for the presentation. Um, you always do a great job of, of uh, helping the board understand our finances. You bring a lot of, of experience and knowledge, and I, I, can, I for one, appreciate that. Um, I did, when we spoke last week, I did uh, apologize in advance if you felt like the board was busting your chops tonight. Uh, but I just want you to start off with the good part, which is you did a great job. Um, <laughs> however, um, three things that I think would improve upon this presentation um, f uh, for the benefit of the board and for the community at large. One is, and you alluded to this, um, when you talked about transportation, you know, we have our, our fund balances as of June 30th, um, but we don't really see, what I think would be helpful is walking us through a, uh, my, how we came in, look at, look at our projections from a year ago, what those fund balances were going to be, 
and then show us what our actual fund balance were so we can see those, pl those places where we did have some savings due to the shutdown starting in March. And, you know, transportation was one place we said we, we spent $1 million less than the last 50 days of school. Um, where and how did the district's finances change? Um, I guess, hopefully, for the better. So we can see, not, we're not looking at one year, we're seeing how the end of last year um, is, is um, I guess, providing us some, some breathing room. Uh, second thing I would uh, like to see um, for the September presentation would be um, where do we tighten the belt? I know where we're spending more money, uh, things like, like PPE, um, enhanced cleaning, we talk about contracting for um, snow removal and stuff like that so our, our staff can be in, indoors doing the cleaning. So we know where, we're, where our expenditures increase, but where did we find some, where do we, where do we show some discipline in terms of putting off products that were not essential or um, things that, that just you know, we, we're exercising uh, good stewardship of the, of the community's resources. And then last thing um, for Kevin, I think uh, I appreciate your last slide. Um, I'd like to see, you know, one thing we talked about um, at an earlier meeting was I'd like to see you take the, bulls by, the bull by the horns here and give us some more direction in terms mm -hmm. of what you would recommend. Because I'd like to know if I'm gonna, bail, if I'm gonna vote on a budget that is uh, $2 million in the red, what are we going to be doing in the, in the near term? I mean, I'm talking fiscal year 22. I'm not talking about five years down the road, 10 years, over the next 10 years. I'm talking about in the near term, where are we going to be um, recapturing some of that? We need it to be this year 800,000, a million in the black, and we're 2 million in the red. So that's a shift of $3 million. And I'm not expecting that we're going to be able to capture that all back in over one fiscal year, but we should be um, making a big dent next year. Um, so again, I, I, I'm in my head, I'm assuming that next year is going to be great. We're going to be phase five, you know, the pandemic's going to be a thing of the past, but that's just because I'm just trying to be optimistic and my head just can't handle trying to process what it's going to look like if we're still here a year from now where we are now. But just assuming that next year is business as usual, what are we going to, um, how are, you know, what's, what's, what's the administration's recommendation going to look like in order to help us get back to a place where we are, we've not just staunched the bleeding, but we are mm -hmm. recovering some of our lost, um, our lot, like get, digging ourselves out of the hole that we are in this year. Right. And we can, and we can certainly put through those pieces, what you've talked about as far as, you know, in the final budget presentation of the differentials and, and some of those pieces from, from fiscal year 20. Yeah. And, and, and then some of the other additional charges and costs and shifts and changes that we've made for from 20 to 21 both additions to the budget for those costs but also then what we've adjusted downward and, and that's one of the things you know those tr the transportation piece um, is at 98 percent of last year's budget if we didn't have if we weren't moving into remote it would be 106 percent or 104 percent of last year's budget because um, of those contract increases that we knew we were going to pay. Or well, we can put those into a more of a dollar structure format for it. Thank you. Greg? Anyone else? I had a question. Uh, given all of the uncertainty for this upcoming fiscal year, you can only really point to your assumptions and try to make sure your assumptions are as good as can be. One of the assumptions that we're making is that the TIF comes off. Is there any potential that, given the economic situation, that that TIF does not come off and that they continue to extend that? Uh, I've checked as of la two weeks ago uh, with the village, and that is their anticipation that that is done, um, and they will follow. They're going to follow the rules and 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 the regulations that the TIF will. Um, expire and they will pass a resolution. Tax increment finance districts have 23 years to exist under statute. They, the, the municipality can extend them if they so wish. They have to go through a, a lengthy process to do that. Um, it has fulfilled its function. It has paid off its obligations and, and done what my understanding is what it's needed to do. Um, my understanding is the village doesn't see a need for it to exist to continue and they understand the value of that um, and that revenue for us as well as the high school district. Um, so it is, 
our understanding that they are every bit going to, to go through that process and pass the resolutions and file those with the clerk. When would we know officially that they have taken those steps? When can December. we anticipate that? We get a full year before. I mean, they will. They need to do that. They need to do that. I'll get the. I'll get the date and the sure. final piece, but they have to file it with the count with the clerk by the December of 21. We'll know well into into the format. Uh, sorry. This December, I'll, I'll get you the updates okay. and when that has to happen. The um, other thing, Karat, just yeah. to piggyback off what you said, one of the things that Todd and I are working very closely with the village, and, and they haven't shared that there's any news for additional tips, but sometimes through economic crisis like 2008 or what we're in right now, that could be a potential down the road where other tips may open up as a result of closing businesses and things like that. So we're certainly, um, the village of Downers Grove is great. They always keep us in the loop, but that is something that, you know, kind of our long-term thinking is what could potentially be next on the uh, on the radar here in Downers Grove for redevelopment. Um, the Ogden Avenue tip is something that, that's a little further behind that. The downtown tip, we're looking at the, when that comes off as well, but could there potentially be others? Um, we are certainly gonna continue to, to keep our eye out for that as well. Um, thanks. You, uh, one more question. Uh, I think that, uh, Kevin, your point around tough conversations that we have to have, I think is uh, dead on. I think many of us would agree that that's a conversation that we need to not only have, but also start to answer. Mm -hmm. um, there is an assumption in there that I don't know if I have the numbers for to be able to feed it. And so when we start to have those conversations, I make a request for some, some information. Uh, the cost to maintain some of our buildings, the operational cost mm -hmm. for maintaining specific buildings, mm -hmm. I think would be helpful for us to know what is in essence like the cost that we no longer pay if we no longer have a Longfellow. There are additional costs that we then have to pay if we shift those things elsewhere. All of our uh, uh, broadband piping would have to be reshifted to, to some other place, right? So there are costs that we would buy, but there are also costs that we would save. Just not knowing the like, actual maintenance costs of individual building makes it hard to even start that conversation, mm -hmm. uh, to know what future budget impact it would have. So that's a, a request when we start to have those conversations to have cost of maintenance by building. Um, and that, that's probably too simple, but uh, something in that direction that helps us start to have mm -hmm. the conversation where we're talking, talking about actual numbers. Um, that was it, thanks. Thank you, Kara. Anyone else? I, I do have a question. Um, and, I, and I guess it comes uh, from this. Well, I'm optimistic that some good things are on the horizon here about being able to, to get kids back into the buildings. We're seeing, you know, maybe some, some better news coming out of the Illinois Department of Public Health and, and, and stuff along those lines. Um, I'm not naive in the fact that other obstacles may come, come forward. If we approach that September 28th meeting and uh, that was kind of that next step for guidance, is there and we are looking at making remote learning longer term. Is there, does there need to be any kind of shifts? Would that impact any kind of shifts in spending one way or the other? Is there opportunities for us through contracts or through um, staffing or through, um, you know, not using all of our buildings, whatever it might be that would, would shift that down a little bit? Or are there things that you would expect our expenditures to go up because we're continuing to try to maintain remote learning or you know, any, anything like that that you foresee that we need to be paying, because that meeting is going to correlate with um, us finalizing this budget. So I just didn't know if there's something that we should be on, on the lookout for as we approach that meeting. So the longer we're in remote, um, you have some operational savings, right? Because you, I mean, even though we, have, we will have staff in the buildings and we will do the same sanitation process and everything, we still have just some lower impact, lower cleaning. We will not, and, and this is a conversation that uh, Kevin Bardo and I had today, you know, we're in this format. We have planned to do contracted services to do this, this, and this, and that's kind of why I tried to dilute a little bit. You know, if we aren't, 
if we're going to be remote through the fall, we don't need to contract any additional increase in landscape because the custodians can keep up with their current structure of cleaning and maintain that piece. Uh, if we're going into the winter months, our big good, bad, or indifferent, our biggest snowfall last year, last winter was, was Halloween. Um, <laughs> freaky enough as it is. Um, if we are remote on Halloween, you know, we and, and into the November time frame, we certainly will not go out to, you know, we may pay if we have to contract out in January, a, you know, a higher rate, but we won't have those months that we're paying, in, you know, in, into uh, through the 2020 calendar year. So we will be mindful of, of those pieces and try to manage that as best we can to control those operational expenses. Obviously, we won't have to necessarily use some of, you know, sub costs and so forth, um, both for custodians and, you know, maybe some other areas and staffing, um, you know, because we'll be able to, to manage some things that there are assumptions and, you know, standard things that we usually spend every year that we won't have to do. Okay. Um, so there is some of that. And, though, and, and the transportation piece is obviously a part of that as well. Mm -hmm. Though, you know, we do kind of presume that, that that's going to be a lesser expense. You know, we, we've adjusted that down considering that, that that's going to be where it's at for a period of time. Because I know, obviously, we have budgeted and planned and organized our district around the idea of teaching children in person and that's the way we're structured so yeah I just if for some reason we think this is going to go longer does does our structure make sense um, is there something that we need to be shifting and talking about to make us more efficient um, in this process and is that a, a bigger conversation that we and I don't I'm not saying that that has to be September 28th but if right. September 28th we're coming back with a prediction that that this is going to be a little bit longer haul than we thought then we need to make sure we're looking at our structure and that we're running efficiently and working hard obviously um, when we look at the, the budget here, yes, I, I feel better that we're not in a negative CPI situation. That doesn't mean that can't shift. Right. We, I mean, markets are still looking okay. I mean, we see that the economy is, is trying to move forward, but there's no guarantee that one bit of bad news doesn't take it and, and just and, and drop kick us again. So we just got to be mentally prepared for that. So, all right, well. well and, and there's just, I mean, like I said, there's one, I mean, I like put in the assumptions of field trips in the spring if we don't end up doing those that's if there's there's a cost savings to that piece there's a psychological piece of taking them out right. and you know i don't think we were ready i don't think today we're ready to say that that's we're just going to say we're not going to budget now we cannot budget them know that if we get to that point and we can start offering them we can adjust and make you know adjustments and it's not you know that that piece doesn't isn't going to run us over you know where you have to re amend the budget because it's not a huge expense over the whole thing comparative to 72 million dollars mm -hmm. but psychologically not budgeting them hoping you know to have them in is just another piece that well, i think the assumption that a lot of us are under at least i'm i'm speaking for myself is that we're sort of budgeting right now for for every possibility and that's is, just it this is yeah. kind of a worst case we're planning for us coming back in and having to go that that back to that format of expense but not a, being able to recap some of that revenue you know particularly like the Oki pieces that you know right. we're not gonna be able to roll that no we're able to roll that back in in january and put that together that'd be great mm -hmm. um and, and start issuing that um but that's not an assumption i could budget that revenue today no and that's the same piece of the conversation we talk about. And we need to be conservative about budgeting. We need to be more conservative about budgeting our revenue than most other, be given our fund balance piece. Mm -hmm. And so when it's not so much as we talk about this piece and where we're at, but what's coming in 22 and what we're looking at, what's on the ground when we start having those conversations in December and January and February. Um, and you know we're going to have to to be a little more level set in that when we make those 
staffing recommendations, decisions, and recommendations to the board when we're focusing on that piece, given what we have available in the bank. I understand. I appreciate those are going to be really hard conversations, just like uh, some of the facility stuff that we were talking about. None of us want to be in that position where we're having that conversation, but at the same time, um, it's our duty right now to be the grown-ups in the room talking about every possibility and the impact so that we're not sitting here in 2022 making really terrible um, draconian cuts or something like that because we didn't we didn't do little things as we moved along so that, thank you very much I actually have a question um, on the slide um, talking about conversations that need to take place because I I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and um, in the last year and a half we've had lots of big big picture um, ta uh, conversations I'm just wondering if there are um, if there's a time sensitivity or if if this is are we just throwing this out there right now or do you anticipate in the next three two months three months we need to I mean Longfellow has been a topic of conversation I've been following the board for five years now and that's been a topic for the entire time I've been either on the board or sitting in the audience not to cut you off Trey I think it's been a topic since the mid 1980s when, <laughs> when it closed I'm not, I'm not trying to be so sure. I mean we had momentum and that's why like this is so painful because we were making such great strides with the citizen task force yeah. and all these things so um and then the pandemic hit and so mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if if we're going to be proactively talking about this or waiting to see where the chips fall or could we like start can we move this along now that we're starting the year remotely Oops. and you know at first, we were just trying to take care of the kids and the staff and everyone and get and have a plan. Now that that's kind of the dust has settled a little bit, can we move forward on some of these other things? Yeah, so thank you for that. And um, one of the things I want to highlight is to take us back to our spring conversations. What we had settled on it, as a board through conversations is that by the end of this year, we're going to make a determination. And what I mean is the end of this calendar year, not a fiscal year about whether or not um, we're in a short-term situation where then we could start having conversations about referendums if things quickly bounce back or whether or not we're in a much different conversation with some long-term adjustments and, and so we've been targeting as an administrative team november december to really make those final decisions about which path we want to go down i think it'll be much clearer at that particular point especially as we start to look at cpi numbers and in the impact that we have so the point of this particular slide was really um, to remind the community, to remind everybody where we were at in those conversations in the spring. We said we wanted to see where we were at in the summer. We'd constantly revisit the idea of potentially going to a referendum if, if economic conditions stay the way they are. I really do see us moving forward with many of these uh, conversations that you see on, on the list there. One of the other points that I want to make with this particular board uh, conversation is that we have been being very very cautious about staffing coming into this school year i don't want anyone to think that we're at the same levels that we were at um, you know pre-pandemic um, but we can continue to evaluate that um, as we move forward so i know a lot of the public might be out there saying well wait a second do we just have double the kindergarten teachers that we need no the all of those positions have been redeployed and, and spread out to lower class sizes to do things like that so I don't want anyone to think that we've got you know a bullpen full of staff that that we're just waiting to call in we've been very very careful not to uh, you know if, if people retire or if people resign to really absorb a lot of that so we're not you know double dipping and, and just having people you know w without anything to do now of course as we start up remote learning we're going to continue to evaluate that to determine how long are we going to be in this phase and that can further impact staffing I I as we go through so I, I did want to make sure that Everyone understood that as it, it, we're, we're looking at this um, because staffing is always the biggest cost that we're going to have as a school district being a, a service organization. So I wanted to throw that on there and, and also to answer your Longfellow question. So to come full circle, uh, November is really what we're targeting November, December to, to determine which path we want to uh, finally make a decision and go down. Thank you. That, that helps me think it's not, not like this big idea and that planning no because re really when we look at it um, again we do not have the option of running a multi-year deficit and so if we are in a position in November and December where it looks like that could even be a possibility then we really have to have 
that conversation about which path are we going to go down. And um, we, we've been putting it on hold, and rightfully so, uh, but that does have to happen by the end of this calendar year. Thank you for clarifying. Just a, a quick question, kind of piggybacking off of that. Um, let's say in November, December, the administration comes and recommends that we just, given the, the circumstances of the time, we should go down the path of looking more at um, assets we could possibly mm -hmm. um, sell, such as Longfellow, or some sort of reutilization of buildings in a different manner, et cetera, um, as opposed to perhaps like a referendum round or something like that. Um, how long, like when would we start to see the financial benefits of those changes? Would that be in like fiscal year 22? Or would it, how long do you anticipate like seeing Dep the positive benefits come from Depends those on the changes? change. I mean, it could take. It, it depends on the change in which decisions we make and how that's going to going to affect. Um, Longfellow, it will take time to disengage from that facility, given what we have and what we need to move. Yeah, you know, uh, James reminds me, it's the tech hub and time that it takes to move and, and so forth. So there is that it's piece. To go to. Um, it doesn't mean that we couldn't sell and rent back for a period of time, you know, till we move. Mm -hmm. That's also an option piece so that it gives us some time mm -hmm. to have that flex piece um, to get that wherever that would be and go. Um, if it's realignment of facilities, mm -hmm. depending upon on how quickly the district would like to move in that direction, um, an immediate fiscal year or school year is, is, could be a big shake. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is, and the other thing we have to keep in all options on, in mind, um, because there's some conversation, you know, if we adjust and do different things with, we may need all the square footage. If, we're, if we move to modified on site, mm -hmm. the worst case scenario is moving to modified on site for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. where you need to have the small class size, the staffing structure, and the square footage to execute it. Um, that you know, without the revenue source to offset, that is a big. That's that's the worst case, and I we don't have a structure outside of some significant increase from state and federal to help that out. And, and just to piggyback off of that, I think that is the work that we will continue to do um, to Craft Point. What is the true cost of this, right? So so you can say well and I'm making this number up, but you, $10 million if you sell this or that, right? Well, then you got to backtrack. What, what's the demolition? What's it cost to move your servers? What's it cost to run the, 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 the fiber, all of that? Um, you know, do you, if you want to consolidate the administrative center um, for a year or two, work out of the building or, or work out of one of the underutilized buildings and then rent a facility? I mean, so there are all sorts of different options. What I would never recommend any Board of Education do is what I call a quick light switch change where you say in December, hey, guess what, next fall, everybody's world is going to be different. Um, that is not how we should do that. So I wouldn't say, Emily, you're going to see like a quick six month huge impact. I think we're looking at, um, you know, potential perhaps spending a little bit of money up front to save a lot of money uh, down the road. But, but again, that is our task as we come to you with these different options to talk about not only what the community engagement process will look like, but short-term and long-term uh, mm -hmm. ramifications. You could do it very quickly, you could do it over a more sustained path, and that's what I would always recommend the latter. And, there, and there's also the possibility of, I talked about the low interest rate piece, and yeah, there is some, I mean, business does it on a routine basis. There is some ability to, to bond out for a short period of time. Out of, you know, if you have a direction and a structure you're gonna execute, in fiscal year 23 to cover and bond and cover those expenses in 22 without substantially impacting. Now, you have to have a, an absolute decision piece that's gonna impact and, and reverse some of that shortfall in that and cover those expenses in 23, 24 and onward, but that is, a capa that is a, also a possibility. There's gonna be a lot of pieces that we're gonna talk about um, we do have tools and resources. We're not without them. Some of them just come with, you know, an expense piece down the road. 
Can I just ask one quick thing? So I think this is more for Kevin. Yeah. Um, you did touch base, but I, again, the most I've seen is 21 people watching this. And so rumor <laughs> mill starting already um, of what we're talking about That'd tonight, that there will be community engagement once it's decided what road we're going down. Yeah. So I cannot emphasize this enough. So before we would get to any kind of a recommendation to the Board of Education, you have a community group that is already at work on all of this. We paused their work and that's the Citizens Task Force. And, and this is a committee that's already been looking at many of these things. Um, I would not feel comfortable coming to the Board of Education about any of these things without uh, going back and tapping a group like that who's who's already been looking at all of this um, it's a very diverse group uh, and uh, they, they really have a good um, good way of looking at things that I think would be would be very good so again I can't emphasize enough and I'll say this again no decisions have been made no recommendations um, however when we're in tough times we do have to start talking about these things um, if we're going to even go down the path of boundary adjustments or something like that I think we uh, have a lot to learn from some of our neighbors who have been through boundary adjustments. I've been through uh, several throughout my career. There is a right way to do this and there's a wrong way to do this. In my view, the right way to do this is community engagement. And you talk about the, the, the pros and in, in, in the cons and you lay it all out there for the public to see. The wrong way to do this is, you know, with the, just the seven of, of you up there and a few administrators and making a recommendation, that is not the way I would ever recommend doing something like this, especially in a community like Downers Grove that has pretty long-standing tradition of boundaries and things like that. Um, doesn't mean that you can't have change though in these, you just have to do it the right way. And look no further than District 203 in Naperville. Mm -hmm. That went through a very rough patch where they tried a couple of different ways to approach this. In my view, the way they got it to work was when they engaged the community and really did a nice job of bringing everybody uh, together. Thank you. So I, I just want to clarify one thing and going back to what Greg said, I think it was three points, and one of them was, all right, if we're, the reality of the situation is we're at a, you know, $2.1 million deficit and we sharpen our pencil, we get down to 1.5, but what I interpret that to, to mean, Greg, is you're, you're looking for uh, part of that recommendation. No, I guess, I mean, it, it my, I rephrased my comments based on some of the things we've been talking about since then. I just think that, um, we don't want to just be given a menu and say pick from it. Yeah. We want to have a stronger recommendation from the administration in terms of what that's going to be. And that's, that's some feedback we had after, um, I think it was a meeting at Longfellow. Um, we were talking about, well, I can't remember what the, what the purpose of the meeting was, but we said we just don't, we want to have some clear direction from the administration, not like a pick, you know, what, what do you think we should do? Mm -hmm. We want some okay. clear guidance. All right, I, I just want to make sure come September, um, we're kind of all looking at that November, December kind mm -hmm. of initial sense. recommendation is, is kind of an acceptable path to, yeah. to okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Th thank you, Todd. Appreciate it. All right, it's that time now for public comment. The board has allotted 30 minutes for the extended opportunity uh, with the board and community communications. We ask that you keep your comments to three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Um, there is nobody in person today, so I'm anticipating no cards. If there is some, I'm a little weirded out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, then at this time, we will go ahead and play any public comments that we have. We have one, is that what you said? Yes. All right, so we have one comment uh, that was provided by a phone. Hello, my name is Brian Sweeney, and I have two children that attend the District 58 schools, and I have loved ones, friends, and family that work in the District 58 schools. And I know that the air conditioning is not on for some of these staff that has to go inside of the buildings and sit inside classrooms to give Zoom meetings. And I was wondering, will the air conditioning be on at any of the buildings for the teachers and staff anytime soon because it is very hard to keep a mask on when you're in a room with other people when it's going to be in the 90s all of this week. 
uh, aside from teachers and staff having trouble breathing and suffering heat exhausted, it also causes concerns about ventilation, whether windows open and fans going are actually complying with the state's ventilation safety guidelines given out by the Illinois Department of Health and the DuPage Department of Health. Uh, it seems cruel and dangerous to make teachers and staff do this without air conditioning. And I'm sure all of you would agree that teachers and staff are amazing heroes that we all need to take care of. So I was hoping, and I know that you can't respond to telephone comments, but I was hoping that you would listen and then maybe think that it would be a good idea to get the air conditioning in for the poor people that have to go in, wear masks, and sit there for over eight hours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We do have a, a little bit of an opportunity for extended comments. I didn't know if you wanted to make any comment on that. I, I do have a question. Do um, If teachers are alone in the room, or any staff alone in a room, do they still keep their masks on? Yeah, so, so for clarifying, um, Mr. Sweeney is welcome to contact any of us here in District 58. Uh, myself, Todd Drayfall, Kevin Bardo would be happy to have a conversation with him um, and, and talk to him about air conditioning. Obviously, this is not something that's new. Yeah. The IDPH has clarified in their FAQ that if a teacher is alone in their room uh, with the door closed, they may take off their mask. So if that is a concern, all of our staff do have the ability to take off their masks. Um, staff also have the ability, while um, 11 of the 13 schools are not air conditioned, there are air conditioned spaces. So one of the things that we did share with our building principals and in their opening meetings to remind staff that, um, you know, obviously practice social distancing, wash hands before you enter and exit a room. Uh, they also have the ability to rotate through those air conditioning spaces in our buildings because there's at least some areas in each one of our buildings that does have um, air conditioning. Longfellow would be a good example. The boardroom has that air conditioning so people can rotate in and out of uh, those spaces. I do want to uh, recognize though, and we've talked about this with our master facility plan, that yes, it is very, very tough to, to be in our buildings in August and September. And that is why our uh, master facility task force, the citizens task force recommended that we did put that on the big proposal. Uh, so air conditioning certainly is something that's always on the forefront of our mind. I've taught in these buildings during these conditions and it is tough. Uh, but, but again, we do have some uh, ways to mitigate uh, that as well. Thank you. And the Illinois Department of Public Health also recommended keeping windows open and running fans. Yeah, so uh, District 58 um, has not told anyone to close their windows. They may keep the windows open. The other thing, um, when staff are there and kids aren't there, we can do some things to help airflow through the building, like opening the exterior doors. We obviously can't do that when students are in session, but we certainly can do that uh, during these times to get a little bit more uh, airflow through. Uh, yeah, I, I do feel for our staff. Um, we all do. Uh, coming back this week, of course, then it shoots up into the mid-90s. We are going to get some relief uh, this weekend, but um, our uh, district is also, you know, providing water, make sure that people can take breaks. They, they do have the ability to step out of the building, uh, you know, take lunch breaks, things like that. And so we want to continue to, uh, to promote that. But it is very difficult uh, to, to be in any building without air conditioning in the 90s, for sure. Well, thank you for that clarity. And I, I, he mentioned it in his call, but I, if, if there's specific questions that he wants to make sure he has a dialogue on, yeah. you know, please give the administration I would encourage anyone uh, that's listening, they're always welcome to call my office and I'm happy to speak with them. And uh, again, Kevin Bardo, myself, Todd Drayfall, I'll be happy to speak with uh, Mr. Sweeney. All right, thank you. Uh, we don't have, again, we don't have anyone here, so there's no follow up in here. So we will go ahead and move on to our recommendations for action. The first one up today is the approval of a tentative budget for the 2020 through 2021 uh, fiscal year. Is there a motion to approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 2020-2021 as presented and make it available for public inspection at the ASC office and on the District 58 website? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Simanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Uh, the motion carried to approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 2020 through 2021 as presented and make it available for the public inspection at the ASC office and on the District 58 website. 
The next is to establish a date for the budget hearing. Is there a motion to establish the date for the budget hearing on Monday, September 28th, 2020 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to establish the date for the budget hearing on Monday, September 28, 2020 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. We have a recommendation for the immediate adoptions of policies 2-260, 2-265, 4-180, 5-200, 5-201, 7 colon 20, 20 and 7 colon 190. Necessary to be legally compliant and meet emergency conditions and 2 colon 232 and 4 colon 182 for renumbering. Is there a motion to adopt policies 2 colon 260, 2 colon 265, 4 colon 180, 5 colon 20, 5 colon tw or 7 colon 20, 7 colon 190, 2 colon 232 and 4 colon 182 as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? So can I, I'm on the policy committee, I just wanted to. Please, um, yeah. Okay, so in a typical process when we have these board meetings, we, um, we will bring a policy up for um, first reading and then the next meeting we'll go ahead and vote on it. Um, in this particular uh, instance, there hasn't been a first reading um, because of the pandemic and trying um, it was basically because of the pandemic um, some of the uh, new policies we needed to um, kind of speed this up as well as some title nine regulations that became effective so we need to make sure um, to go ahead and include those in and so we're not having the regular first reading and then um, voting on it the next month is that basically just yeah, th th that's exactly correct. So every once in a while, you'll get a requirement that um, is passed or there could be a crisis that requires a policy to be immediately put into place. So in this case, on August 14th, the federal government uh, put new restrictions or mandates on school districts regarding Title IX. And so in order to be immediately compliant with those Title IX requirements, we have to put in place these Title IX uh, board policies. This does not preclude the board or, or, or stop you from later on down the road amending some of these policies, but the reason these are being recommended for immediate approval is because we need to be compliant with the Title IX regulations uh, since August 14th. So this is the, the next board meeting uh, that we had the availability to do so. The other one is pandemic, uh, making sure that we're prepared for the pandemic. So that obviously is something that needs to be put in place. And then the final one was about timeout restrictions. If you remember last year, there were significant conversations, a ProPublica article about timeout um, re, uh, restraints being used across Illinois. Our district didn't have a part in that. However, um, the State Board of Education has put in new rules around that. And so this policy would reflect that. So again, to Tracy's point, uh, normally you would put these through a first and second reading in this case in order to make sure that we're compliant with all three of those areas. That's why we're asking for immediate approval. This is not something that takes place all the time, but we do have precedent. Um, if you remember the um, temporary rules for hosting meetings virtually and in public, that was an example of something that we did earlier uh, this summer. With regard to policy 4182, uh, press has recommended or the Illinois Association of School Boards that our individual policies we switch to a number two at the end so we can recognize those better. So all this is is just changing the number to a policy that you've already approved. So that's why we didn't put that one through the reading uh, either. And uh, with these ones that were required by law, we just worked with our attorneys and made sure we just met the base standards. Yeah, so that's exactly correct. There are several other policies, and, and thank you for bringing that up. There are several other policies that do have Title IX language. However, they're attached to other language that we want to make sure the policy committee goes through. So when we work with our attorneys, we said, which ones do we absolutely have to have in place for Title IX to be compliant? And then which ones would you recommend that we go through our normal policy approval on? So there were some core ones that they recommended right away that we put those in place. So an example is 2265, where we have to make sure that we have a Title IX uh, complaint manager and a process specifically for Title IX. Another uh, example of that is 7190. That's the student discipline policy. And so we need to make sure that that is reflective of the new Title IX requirements. So those are the immediate ones. Other ones we will bring through at the September meeting and input through uh, the normal uh, reading process. Thank you. 
Any any other, any questions? Mm -hmm. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt policies 2, 260, 2, 265, 4, 180, 520, 720, 7190, 2, 232, and 4, 118 as presented. A couple of announcements tonight. We do have a few dates to take note of. Monday, August 31st at 3.45 p.m. will be the district leadership team. I'm assuming that's going to be done mostly over Zoom. There's that's no correct, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Friday, September 4th at 7 a.m. will be the Financial Advisory Committee uh, at the ASC and over Zoom. And Monday, September 14th at 7 p.m. will be the next regular board meeting right here at Downers Grove Village Hall. Uh, all right, that wraps us up. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting will adjourn at 8.25 p.m.